The Easter Island giant heads are so popular that they even have their own emoji. Their true meaning has been a mystery for hundreds of years. But it looks like we at least know how they were built and transported to their permanent location. The Moai statues consist of three parts. A large yellow body, a red hat or top knot, and white inset eyes with a coral iris. Around 1,000 of them were created. The main bodies of most of the statues were made out of volcanic tuff from a local quarry in what used to be a volcano. The material is easy to carve, but not so easy to transport. That's probably why researchers found over 300 unfinished moai back in the quarry. The rest of them stand in various locations, facing the villages as if watching over the locals. So, it looks like the statues were carved lying on their backs. Then, their creators detached them from the rock, moved them down slope, and set them in a vertical position to finish the work. Once it was done, it was time to get the statue to its platform. Now, if you've ever moved houses, you know how physically hard it is. So, imagine having to move a statue that is about half as heavy as a house without a car or any modern equipment for a distance of three miles. The locals must have invented some original way of doing it, and scientists tried to recreate it to guess what it was. They tried pulling Moai replicas on wooden sleds. They thought someone could have used palm trees for that purpose, but this theory has been debunked. The most successful experiment so far was wielding ropes to rock the statue down the road in a standing position. This method sounds real because the local Rapa Noai legends mention that the Moai walked from the quarry. And, of course, they needed a good road to get there. In the early 20th century, researcher Catherine Rutledge identified an 800-year-old road network on the island. It was a bunch of pathways around 15 feet wide going from the quarry. She thought that those roads were ceremonial and not built just for the statues. She wasn't a famous scientist back then, so others mostly ignored the theory. Several decades later, famous Norwegian adventurer and archaeologist Thor Heyerdahl published his theory. He mentioned that the roads were built exclusively to transport the Moai and some of the statues were dropped along the roads for some reason. But in 2010, researchers found that the statues weren't randomly dropped. They actually reached their final destinations as they were all set on hidden platforms. Plus, the road floor was U-shaped, so pulling massive statues along them wouldn't be easy. You can still find roughly 15.5 miles of these roads on the island and see them from satellite images. And it looks like Catherine Rutledge was right about them. The roads were probably built for pilgrims to a sacred volcano, and the Moai standing by them were sort of signposts. Halfway across the world in southern England lies another mystery made of stone. A massive sound illusion, a symbol of unity, a burial ground, or more. Scientists are still debating the purpose of Stonehenge. It took Neolithic builders around 1,500 years to construct this beauty made of roughly 100 stones standing upright in a circle. Millions of tourists come to see it every year, and heritage protectors were worried about the modern road snaking close to the landmark. That modern road is now sunk into the ground below the grass level. And even though archaeologists assumed they could find an older road under it, they didn't have any high hopes. But when they took off a layer of asphalt, they noticed two parallel ditches that were nearly perpendicular to the road. The ditches connected the shortened sections of the avenue. That's what the archaeologists call the ancient pathway leading up to Stonehenge. It proves that the ancient people used to visit the monument for their purposes, and probably some ceremonies. Another interesting find during a dry summer was three dry patch marks within the stone circle. 
It looks like they were left there by three massive boulders. So Stonehenge could have been a full circle once. In 2021, archaeologists found a Roman road submerged in the Venetian lagoon. The fact that it runs there on the bottom for nearly 4,000 feet is proof that the Romans were here before sea levels rose and flooded the area. It supports the theory that there was an important settlement here centuries before Venice was founded at the spot in the 5th century CE. The ancient Romans were great at many things, and one of them was building roads. And it looks like they weren't afraid to work on the trickiest terrain. Scans have shown that the ancient road was built right on the beach, and it requires some serious skills. Imagine a village from over a thousand years ago frozen in time. There's still half-eaten food on the tables and personal things left in a rush. It's all preserved so well because it's covered by volcanic ash. Researchers found this village in 2011 in modern-day El Salvador. They believe there was a mass celebration in a Maya village called Seren over 1400 years ago. The whole village was there, preparing the main temple for a ritual when a nearby volcano erupted. The 200-plus residents had no time to rush back to their homes. To save their lives, they had to flee the plaza and run south on a raised road called Sakbe. They managed to escape from the plumes of volcanic ash. In addition to being a superhero and saving all the people, the road had another cool feature. All Sakbe roads had an outer layer of stones. But this one was made of ash. Ironic, isn't it? It proves that the Maya people didn't only use stones to build their roads. Archaeologists discovered several coins in Jerusalem when they were excavating an old street. When they saw the minting dates, they realized the road was built when Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. Since he was the local ruler, it's almost clear that he gave the order to build the road. The pilgrims most likely used this road to reach the Temple Mount for worship. The pathway, which was laid with over 10,000 tons of limestone, was almost as broad as a London bus is long. It had been there for 2,000 years. It's not common that you find such a luxurious road, and it's not clear why a Roman governor would spend so much money on the road. It was probably his attempt to make the city's population like him. Plus, it was a great way to show he had both money and influence. The Old North Trail is an ancient highway that the inhabitants of North America used for 10,000 years. First on foot, then with dogs, and finally with horses. The first travelers moved around the continent down its paths for thousands of miles long before the first Europeans arrived, and even during the last ice age. They used it to carry trade goods, visit relatives, find a mate, or just explore. Researchers keep finding evidence that the stories and legends of the Blackfoot Indians about this trail are real. And it could be even the road that served one of the most massive human migrations, the people who crossed from Asia on the Bering Land Bridge about 15,000 years ago and settled in North America might have used the ice-free corridor along the Rockies, which later became a part of the trail. The Nakasendo Highway was built in the 17th century during the Edo period of Japanese history to link Kyoto and Tokyo. The 310-mile-long road runs across mountain ranges and down onto the plain. It was one of the five main roads used by the feudal lords and their families to travel to the capital. There were 69 post stations on the route where travelers could stay overnight. The road was built for horses and pedestrians, as the Japanese didn't use carts. You can still walk parts of the route. The Moai statues have been standing tall and proud for hundreds of years. Once, people put an enormous effort into carving these grand sculptures. And then, they just suddenly stopped making them. But why? Let's figure out this mystery. 
Easter Island, located 2,500 miles east of Tahiti, has an area of 63 square miles. To this day, it's one of the most isolated islands in the world. Once, it was covered with forests, filled with different trees and ferns. But when the first humans came to the island around 400 CE, the forest slowly began to disappear. And starting from 1250 CE, Moai statues began appearing all over the place. People made them from different types of rock – compressed volcanic ash, basalt, trachyte, and red scoria. As it's a volcanic island, these were all the ingredients the creators of the statues had to use. And once the builders completed their work, they covered the statues with pumice. The faces of the statues are different, but they all have distinct expressions with heavy brows and large noses. Their arms are carved into the body. Some have hats on top of their heads. There are nearly 900 statues all over the island. They differ in size. The average height is 13 feet tall, and the largest ones reach 33 feet in height and weigh up to 82 tons. Because the statues have so many different faces, there are theories that they represent and honor ancestors, chiefs, and other important people who lived on the island. But without any clear evidence, it's almost impossible to figure out the true purpose of the Moai. Once, they stood beautifully along the coast, watching over people in settlements. And their backs faced toward the spirit world of the sea. When Europeans first discovered the Moai statues in the 1700s, many of them had already toppled over. And the construction of statues had stopped way earlier than that. Huge amounts of effort were put into making these things. Expert craftspeople spent a great deal of time slowly carving the statues with basic picks. A team of up to six people would work hard for an entire year to make just one statue. Then they often had to transport it to its special place on the island, as far as 11 miles. With the help of carbon dating, experts have managed to figure out that the statue started to appear in 1250 CE. And then, suddenly, in 1500 CE or so, the process just stopped. The creators of the statue just left their stone chisels where they were last used. And only a quarter of all the statues were actually placed where they were supposed to be. Half of them still remained in the quarry, while others were left on the ground mid-transit. Something happened on the island, and it caused everyone to just lose interest in the statues. There are many theories around why it could happen and they mostly relate to deforestation. Islanders may have used wood to move the statues across the island. They possibly did this with the help of sleds and ropes, or even used logs to roll the statues or canoes to float them. The wood started to deplete eventually. Trees on the island took very long to grow, and rats ate most seeds. People had many uses for wood, and they needed it not only for practical things, but also to create other statues. Another reason why the inhabitants of the island could have stopped building the statues might be that they were busy with other projects. Specialized rock gardens were becoming more common with a growing population. They were great for the soil, keeping it warm and fertilizing it at the same time. Islanders spent much time and effort making these rock gardens, and there simply wasn't enough time to focus on building and moving the statues. Another theory suggests that what people believed in changed over time. Supposedly, the islands once saw the statues as a connection to their ancestors. After some time, though, rituals depicting a show of strength and endurance became more widespread. And with these rituals, islanders started to carve images related to seabirds. Seabirds became the main animal on the island. People started to believe that their ancestors looked over them through birds instead of the statues. So there was no longer a reason to build the moai. Anyway, these theories might be true. But the main problem was that the small island couldn't support a growing population. What was once a lush land covered in forests quickly became a barren landscape. For the first few centuries, people relied on forest resources. But agriculture became more important sometime after 1550, when forests disappeared. Tribes that once worked together to build the fantastic monoliths focused on competing against one another instead. During this struggle for land and resources, the Moai statues were toppled over because people wanted to reduce their significance. Over the following centuries, all the statues were pushed over, but not all of them deliberately. 
Many fell naturally after being neglected for so long. Some even ended up in the ocean water surrounding the island. And there they sat for a while. But there was some good news for these statues. They were re-erected, providing a great experience for visitors from all over the world. If you make a journey all the way to this isolated island, the first question you'll probably ask will not be how the statues were made or how they were moved. It will be, how on earth did anyone even make it here in the first place? It was one of the most amazing feats ever. The Polynesians sure did some pretty extraordinary things. From as early as 1500 BCE, these boat-faring people began to explore their world. They used the most advanced marine inventions of their time. They sailed across the ocean in catamarans and outrigger boats, starting in Southeast Asia and inhabiting many more places throughout the Pacific. They lived as far north as Hawaii in 900 BCE, and all the way to the south in New Zealand by 1200 BCE. And the farthest journey to the east was, of course, Easter Island. In only a few hundred years, these early sailors inhabited an area of thousands of square miles. They simply memorized where they had already been and, this way, managed to navigate the ocean. They used a wide range of techniques. They watched the sun as it rose and set during the day. Stars helped them at night. If it was overcast and sailors couldn't figure out direction visually, they used other brilliant methods. They watched the movements of ocean currents and wave patterns and paid attention to bioluminescence in the water. These patterns helped them find where specific islands were located. These seafarers even understood how islands and atolls in the distance caused air and sea interference patterns. Birds provided them with certain signs, too. Some of them migrated long distances from one island to another, which gave travelers some kind of a visual connection for their route. Other types of birds had specific feeding times. Sailors knew when and where they hunted and directed their boats depending on where these birds fed. Vikings certainly get way too much credit for their seafaring abilities. Where they used a sun compass, the early Polynesians relied purely on the knowledge of how nature itself could guide them. Their skills were so advanced that in 1769, Captain James Cook, an English explorer, even hired a Polynesian navigator because of his extensive knowledge of the seas. But even more surprising was the fact that he drew a map from memory. It covered an area that was 2,000 miles wide. In this region, there were 130 islands, and the navigator knew 74 of those islands by name. At the beginning of their voyage, Captain Cook often disregarded the navigator's advice. But toward the end of their journey, he was very impressed. He also recognized the Polynesians as possibly the most widespread nation on Earth. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.